uh, although Sarah, as, as Bill Mears, talking about devolution, I'm not talking about everything within the devolution settlement, many things, many parts of which go quite beyond my own competence and interests. My interests are mainly about the delivery of social services of all sorts, and what I'm going to be talking about today is particularly what's about to happen in relation to social security, because the Scottish Government is for the first time taking on major responsibilities in relation to social security. So I thought I would start by saying something about the social security system overall. The first of these slides says something which is quite important about where money gets spent in Scotland on social security benefits. Many people have got the idea that social security bills are astronomical, which in a sense they are. We're talking very often about extremely large numbers. The biggest source of those extremely large numbers are pensioners. Most of the money on benefits goes to older people. So the red section over here is about money for older people. You can see that it's 9.6 billion out of 17.7, more than half. And the biggest part of that is the state pension. But it doesn't stop with just the state pension. There's a number of other benefits that pensioners also get. For example, housing benefit. And then, rather unexpectedly, some other benefits. You'll see that I've got disability marked there. That's not just attendance allowance, which you can read from the books. You'll see that pensioners should be getting. They also get DLA, with a third of all the DLA payments going to pensioners. Now, that's a complicated procedure, and I'll probably say something about that in passing as I go past it. But Overwhelmingly, what we're talking about here is not what people imagine. You talk to people about benefits and they think about unemployment and they think about probably disability and some people will think about incapacity. That's a minority of the benefits, and actually a very substantial minority. Look at the breakdown that I've got here. For older people, we're talking about more than half the money. Tax credits and child benefits have produced a large new class of benefits from HMRC. The DWP deals with people mainly of working age in a much more limited sense. That's 5 billion out of the 17.7 billion. In other words, less than a third. And unemployment and incapacity are both in there. If you talk to lots of people about benefits, they'll say, oh, you know, everybody's on the take and it's all fraudulent. And what doesn't occur to them is that right at the start, we're talking mainly about pensioners. Now, I'm not saying that no pensioner has ever committed fraud, but the official figures suggest on retirement pension that it's probably about 0.1% of expenditure. And that's because the rules are straightforward and you either qualify or you don't. And the main way that you could commit fraud as a pensioner or a retirement pension is dying and not telling the government. <laughs> now, not, I'm not to say that no, no, nobody ever does that. You know, of course it can happen. But this is not what people imagine is going on. What people focus on is unemployment, which is this blue dot over here. Relative to total expenditure, I'm afraid it's a very small part of the whole. ESA and capacity benefit here are, is larger than JSA. Sorry, if I look at, look at my circles, I think my circles are not quite proportionate. But again, it's dwarfed by lots of the other things that are going on within the benefit system. So right at the start, I have to say that I think many people have got a distorted perspective on benefits, that they think they're about something that they're not about. If the Scottish Government was given the power to deal with all benefits, which is the arrangement in Northern Ireland, 
What difference would it make? Well, actually, it would make a difference for some groups, certainly, but it's highly unlikely that it would make much difference for pensioners on state pension. Quite simply, that's a commitment that will be honoured pretty much regardless, and although the scope in the long term for future development, that would stay. The Smith Commission was reported, rightly or wrongly, to have submitted to the Cabinet a proposal which would have led to child benefit being devolved to Scotland. That would have led, I think, probably to more differences had it happened, um, and according to the reports at the time, it was struck out by Cabinet. Well, I can't think why, because, it, again, that's pretty uncontentious as these things go. What's actually about to happen with devolution is that the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, I should say, to be correct about this, is picking up a number of responsibilities for a range of different benefits. Already local authorities are dealing with housing benefit, so already there's an extent to which you can say that's been decentralised. But they're picking up the responsibilities particularly for the disability benefits here and here. And that's the bulk of what's going to be transferred. Initially, what the Scottish Government expected to be transferred was about, I was going to say about 2.9 billion from memory, but I've got the figure here, 2.87 billion. And already, because of cuts that have taken place since the Smith Commission, the estimated figure now is 2.2 billion. So already there's been a, a very substantial cut in the amount of money that's going to be available to do this. Now, before I go on to the details of Scotland, I want to say something more generally about social security benefits, which I hope will help to have people who understand where I'm coming from. And besides, it gives a useful plug to my book, which is, um, it's, it can be bought most cheaply, I think, by the publisher's website at the moment. Um, it's a very slim book indeed, but it's called What's Wrong with Social Security Benefits? And in it I argue that a lot of the things that people are really concerned about in Social Security, like migration, like fraud, are not really where the problems are. Part of the reason for that you've just seen, which is where the money actually goes. But what are the big issues? Well, the first one I've put up is the size of the operation. Why does that matter? It matters because of Murphy's Law, which sounds like a joke but isn't. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. It's an engineer's principle. If you go through repeated iterations of a process and you are dealing with hundreds of thousands of people, then someone somewhere is going to catch you out. Quite simply, that's unavoidable. Whatever happens with the new social security system, it's going to go wrong. And we've got to be aware of that. The object is to reduce the number of times when it goes wrong to the minimum and to make sure that there's a system for correcting things when they do go wrong. But you cannot run a system of this sort of size without bad things happening. And we know what's going to happen when, basically, when the first cases come up, you're going to see the press laying in to the government for their incompetence in allowing something to be true. Unfortunately, it, that is inevitable. It's part of the process. The next thing I've said is complex situations, complex lives. We've got a very complex benefit system and lots of people say, couldn't it just be simpler? Couldn't it just be easier? Well, in some ways it could, but it's not so straightforward. Do we want benefits for pensioners? Do we want benefits for people with disabilities? Do we want benefits for people who are sick? What about lone parents? What about covering housing? It goes on and on like this. And at each point, the system gets more complicated because you've got circumstances that need to be adjusted to. One of the simplest reasons why things go wrong is that people move about. And because they move about, because they change addresses, and people on lower incomes change addresses rather more, then 
we know that a system is going to falter. Now, there are ways you can try to deal with that. You can slow things down. We used to have a rule on housing benefit, long gone, that you got your housing benefit for six months. It makes a huge difference. Something the Scottish Government has just proposed, I think very sensibly, in relation to the add-on for carers' allowance, is to pay two payments a year, rather than trying to fine-tune it. The, the difficulty is that fine-tuning, personalisation, one of the big buzzwords of government in Scotland, means that you've got to try to keep track of people's circumstances. And the more you do that, the more difficult it gets. And that gets me to the next thing I've got here, presumptuous administration. Governments are constantly convinced that they have, could only, if they get a faster, swisher computer, then they'll be able to keep track with people's lives and people's situations. And it's just a question of administering better. Oh, sorry. It isn't just a question of administering better. There was a survey not that long ago done, um, what is actually part, part of more general surveys done by the Office of National Statistics on an ad hoc request for the DWP about people with disabilities. And what came back from this was that whereas the DWP thought these people were disabled, they met certain, <coughs> certain criteria, the people who they were talking to didn't think so. About 60, 60, sorry, 61, 62% of people basically said, no, I'm not disabled. And then another 13% or so said, I'm disabled sometimes. And that means that fully three quarters of people with a disability do not recognize themselves as being disabled. Now, if somebody can't actually tell you whether they're disabled or not, clearly they find, they find it terribly difficult to tell the benefits authorities that they're disabled. And that's, I'm afraid, often typical. Anybody who's been through a separation or divorce probably has gone through a period of uncertainty, not knowing actually whether they still had a partner or whether they didn't. I don't know how many people in this room have done the sort of job or the sort of work where you didn't know whether you had a job yet. <laughs> Yeah? Now, I see, I see a couple of nods. Um, again, when people are repartnering, they don't actually know whether they're in a permanent relationship yet. I mean, if only the world was so clear-cut. So people, we constantly ask people questions that they do not know the answers to. And something that anybody has heard as an advisor is people saying, I don't know what to write down. Tell me what to write. Tell me what the answer should be because they can't work out how it relates to their own circumstances. That also gives us problems when governments want to introduce conditionality. That is, typically it's moral conditions, where they don't want, they, they say, we want to send a message to people. And so they introduce benefit rules which seem to them to, for example, give them an incentive to work. A clear example of this is what's happened recently with JSA, where the government decided it would be a good idea to start increasing the amount of time that people were looking for a job to 35 hours a week. Now, how do you know that somebody is working for 35 hours a week? And how, let, let, let me ask for those of you in work, how many of you actually know how many hours you did to the nearest minute uh, last week, life it, again doesn't quite fit this. What they've actually done is that they've created a huge administrative burden to try to work out whether or not people meet the 35 hour standards. I didn't like the system before that which was about taking at least three steps during the week to do it, but at least that was something you could demonstrate. 35 hours a week is it near enough impossible to demonstrate. Overcomplication. This stretches into lots of things. There are, there are times when the rules simply become archaic. The rules about which capital gets taken into account and which capital doesn't get taken into account. The periods for which you get benefit. Let me give an example, and I'm going to apologise in advance. This is going to be incomprehensible, but that's my point. Uh, that if you claim a national insurance benefit, then the benefit contribution 
is, that's taken to be relevant is the one which occurs in the tax year preceding the current calendar year. Uh, right, I've seen some people nodding, you're familiar with this already. Oh, it's not that complicated for you, you've got it already. But, you know, but, the, but this sort of thing is, again, if you've ever tried talking with somebody about this and trying to backtrack, um, I, I used birthdays and Christmas to try and locate a good idea. What were you doing then to try to piece together a history? Because people just do not know the answers. It's made worse by the general things in perfect systems. Selectivity is, some, is not the same as means testing. Selectivity is trying to separate the sheep from the goats, trying to work out who is entitled, and very important for governments, who is not entitled. And that is always difficult, particularly difficult at boundaries. We've seen, for example, the rollout of more and more point schemes to try to work out who's entitled and who's not. And we've also seen a great deal of confusion in the application of those schemes, where the people who are running them seem often not to understand the principles. I've been rather disturbed, for example, at reports about PIP, where people are being asked about their ability to work, which has nothing whatever to do with your entitlement to PIP. Means testing is intrinsically problematic. The reason it's intrinsically pro problematic is that people's incomes go up and down very rapidly. Some work on done by low-income families is suggestive, it's not a proof, showed people's incomes doubling or halving in a three-month period. And when that happens, people don't, you know, you say to somebody, what's your anticipated income next month? They don't know. What was your income last month? They don't know, they have to check. And what we're increasingly asking people for is detailed information and we get indignant when they don't provide it. The last of the things which I've mentioned is the problem of correcting mistakes. We have a system where we think that the way to correct mistakes is to be adversarial. That is that people have got to register. First, something called a, for a mandatory reconsideration which goes back to the DWP is considered internally, and then on the response to that, you may or they may not have a right to appeal subsequently. This is not the way to run a railroad or anything else. What they should be doing with complaints, and what most local authorities do with complaints, is they record the complaints and they decide, do we need to change the system as a result of this complaint? Is there something going wrong? And you learn from the mistakes and you correct them as quickly as you can. I mean, so it's very standard customer servicing, which is not what we do in relation to benefits. And that's going to be quite important for what's coming up. So the problems that I'm identifying are problems very often of governmental overreach. Money is much more straightforward, I think, than people often realize. It really doesn't matter if you've got five benefits or ten benefits, because they all get added together in somebody's, typically in somebody's bank account now. Money, the technical term for that is that money is fungible, it mixes with other money. So you can actually have money from different sources, contributing things, providing the rules don't say, as they say in some benefits, that the better money you get on this benefit stops you getting the money from another benefit. So in the case of carer's allowance, again I don't know that a lot of people have had a contact with this or direct experience, Lots of people in carer's allowance get a note saying, you are entitled to carer's allowance, but we're not going to pay you anything because it's a notional entitlement. Yep. Pardon? Sorry. Very, you know, uh, just say blank stairs from the room. Yeah, yes, yeah, so it, it is. Uh, and, yeah, obviously, people are baffled. They say, what? And the, you see, the, it, the rule is that um, you can only get one so-called income replacement benefit, whatever it may be, and if you've got another income replacement benefit, your income's already been replaced, so you can't get the carer's allowance. And it's only, that's going to affect lots of the people who won't be getting any sort of upgrade as carers from the Scottish Government's new initiative, because it's being piggybacked on the DWP system. Okay, that's all by way of background. That's basically <coughs> about the system. Now, what's happening or what's about to happen in Scotland. I'm starting here with the Scotland Act. The Scotland Act doesn't change a single rule about benefits directly. What the Scotland Government, uh, Scotland Act does is that it creates the powers for Scottish governments, the Scottish Parliament, 
to start making rules about benefits. The basic rules here covered disability, carers, industrial injury, maternity, funerals, heating, topping up benefits, about which more shortly, discretionary housing payments, the Scottish Welfare Fund, Welfare Foods, the power to create new benefits, some little rules affecting universal credit and some rules affecting employment programmes. The way that that's being interpreted by the Scottish Government is they say, well, we're taking on responsibility for existing benefits, which is not actually what the Act says. Leaving aside the differences in rules, this is only about powers, but the benefits that are being transferred are disability living allowance, personal independence, attendance allowance and severe disablement allowance, that's all related to disability. <coughs> Industrial injuries benefits is also about disability. Then welfare foods, cold weather payments, funeral payment, sure start maternity grant and carer's allowance. I've deliberately left one thing off that list, which is winter fuel payment, because actually it's not in the Scotland Act. But I think that everybody thinks that, it's, that it is, so it's probably going to get transferred as well. And then, Added to that, there's the Scottish Welfare Fund, social work benefits, social care, tax, council tax reduction and discretionary housing payments, all of which already happen in Scotland. It's a collection of benefits. I mean, the biggest block of that are benefits related to disability. So I'll have more to say about disability shortly. But the block of benefits we've got, the overall uh, pattern that we're seeing, is mainly benefits which are difficult. They're complicated. In some cases, they are nightmarishly complicated. I'd point in particular to the current rules for funeral assistance. Now, I imagine that even if you're in this situation, you probably haven't claimed because most people don't. But if you claim funeral assistance from the social fund, as was, you'd have, uh, I think it's a 36-page form to fill which asks you, first of all, about your personal household circumstances and income, then about the personal and household circumstances of the person who's died, then about the funeral arrangements, and then about the circumstances and income of other relatives who may or may not have been responsible for the funeral and finally, a statement about everybody's relationship to the deceased because then they can work out who ought to be paying for the funeral and who ought not. Ancestry.com. Sorry? Ancestry.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, but listen, why is this... I mean, you can see it's going to be grim. It's asking you about lots of other people who you may not know about. It's difficult enough answering these questions about yourself, let alone about your brother-in-law who... who emigrated to Tasmania, you know, it, 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 these sorts of things are really complex and difficult. The fundamental problem with funeral expenses, and the reason I take on that as an example, is quite simply, there are too many moving parts. And it's a glorious illustration of what I was saying about presumptuous administration. The idea that you can go into all of these details, come up with this sort of information. Funeral benefits, by the way, will be one of the first things that gets transferred but more of that in a moment. What's happening to the powers that aren't being transferred? They remain with the UK government, uh, the UK Parliament in Westminster. So they're still doing things? So they're still going. And, they, and they're not actually transferring powers, in the sense that they are retaining the powers. So although they may agree to pass the benefits over, and it looks as if they are working on that basis, there's nothing which actually says the DWP is not allowed to do them. What it means is that if the DWP said, we want to carry on paying this benefit anyway, they could do so. And almost certainly there'll be um, certain benefits on which they, you know, effectively they're not going to be transferred. This does not say from such and such a time the Scottish Government is responsible for doing this and we're not. It, it, there's nothing which says that. So technically the Scottish Parliament could do nothing and just leave it with the DWP. One of the oddest transfers in this is severe discernment allowance. This was not in Smith. It was not in the Smith Commission. It's simply that, that severe discernment allowance was closed to new claims 
oh gosh, I'm trying to remember, it must be 2001, 2002, that sort of time anyway. And the only a very, very small number of people have been growing up with severe disabled allowance and they'll, they'll be all shunted off to other benefits within a couple of years. So simply, um, the Scottish Parliament's been handed the residual numbers to look after. Um, but, <coughs> but, but I don't know, why? Because it's an inconvenience to the DWP. Excuse me, forgive sure. my paranoia, but if the DWP decided to take out and continue to pay all of the current benefits that they currently do and do not transfer that over, is that a possibility? It's possible, but it's unlikely because it would imply that the DWP was carrying the financial responsibility. And the DWP, I think, is rather keen on getting rid of financial responsibilities. I'm coming on to financial responsibilities in, ju in just a moment. Um, so it's, a, it's, un it's unlikely. It's much more likely the DWP will say, you've got the powers, you do it. So what about employment programmes, which are a bit more than benefits? Uh, employment programmes, uh, I put on there, that's within the powers. In the Scotland Act, they have inexplicably restricted the Scottish Government's powers on employment programmes to people who've been unemployed for at least a year. And I've already made the argument on employment programmes that you, even within the current legislation you don't have to accept that because you can do top-ups. You can top up the reserve so that you can top up on a on an employment programme. And there are lots of cases where it's entirely appropriate to have an employ employability course that lasts six weeks, three, three months. You, you could, for example, have employability programmes where people were taught to drive. So that's something to do in France. You don't need a year for that. And it will enhance people's job prospects. Um, the, the, there are French courses that teach people how to cook. That's because they're French, of course. Uh, there, are, say there are lots of different ways of doing this where you can actually say, look, maybe we want to do it in another way. We could do things that give people um, health and safety certificates. You know, so, so a bit of imagination in employment programmes would not go amiss. But it's not technically what... The gov what the UK government thought that they were doing in creating the Scotland Act. The next slide I call the rules of the game. <coughs> this is really about the devolution settlement and it's to do with the technicalities as it applies to social security. Right. Rule one is that everything is to be. <laughs> the Schedule to the original Scotland Act basically says that Scotland has no rights to do anything at all that looks like or feels like social security. That's the starting position. Now what they could have done with the Scotland Act version 2 is to say that provision no longer applies but we want to keep certain things to Westminster. They didn't say that. They said everything is forbidden apart from those things which are accepted. And then they said, and here are the exceptions to the exceptions. The most convoluted way of doing it, done quite deliberately to restrict the scope of action. And for a while during the parliamentary debates, it really looked as if Scotland wasn't going to be given the ability to create new benefits even within the areas of devolved powers. And that has now been put in the legislation after multiple protests and uh, amendments in committees. Likewise, the, the topping up wasn't originally there. Um, basically, everything that was won in Smith, I'm afraid, was subsequently challenged and tested. And even now, there are a range of other problems. The thing I see as central to the problems is called the no detriment principle, and that is in Smith. Smith basically said that we cannot have the situation where the Scottish government can introduce rules which play beggar my neighbour and require the UK government to pay more. Conversely, the UK government shouldn't be allowed to play games 
passing costs over. So the no relational principle is supposed to work in both directions, that any thing that happens after devolution should not have an effect. Subsequent to that, we had something called the Financial Framework Agreement. And in the Financial Framework Agreement, you'll see one of the killer clauses, which says that wherever the costs are unexpected, they will be borne by Scotland. Now, what is this actually going to mean? We saw, first off, in the white paper, an illustration of what the Treasury thoughts ought to apply as a result of the no detriment principle. And their illustration was vehicle excise duty, which, were, from which people would be exempt if they got a blue badge. And the argument was that if Scotland issued more than its quota of blue badges, that there would be a charge levied against Scotland for the loss of vehicle excise duty. And I'm afraid, looking at that example, my heart sank, because I thought, you know, if we're really going to get into that level of detail, it's going to be bad. Now, we've actually seen an illustration of this. What actually happens? And the illustration comes from stamp duty, which was done a couple of years ago, where that was before the Scotland Act, where there was a transfer of responsibility for the stamp duty which is charged on property exchanges. HMRC have billed the Scottish Government now the best part of a million pounds for the administrative cost of changing their computer systems so that they will not be levying charges from Scottish citizens. So let me repeat, repeat that in, a, in other words. What HMRC is charging the Scottish Government for is the cost of not doing anything. <laughs> Which I, as I, said, I, I thought is quite staggering. Uh, and that, that was in an audit commission report. And you look at it and you think, what? Who signed this off? Who agreed to pay this series of invoices? Surely then, surely then the government would be able to levy a charge for actually doing it then. <laughs> yes. Well, well, well no, in principle, um, I think that there could be counterclaims, but we've got to understand that this is a rigged game. And the nature of the rigging is that there are all sorts of things for which people can be charged. I heard a rumour, I mean, the first thing I told you is absolutely straight because it's from audit things, and the rumour is possibly not true, but I was told that when Scotland took over um, Scottish revenue in, from HMRC, um, that they were charged £6 million for changing the letterheads. But that is a rumour. I shouldn't say this because I'm not film. <laughs> <laughs> I have no proof of it. Right, the, so the, there is a problem, and the problem is that there's going to be a huge amount of cross-billing. Problem two, and I think it's probably possible to use, is the Northern Ireland example. Now, Northern Ireland has completely devolved social security benefits. All the powers rest with the Northern Ireland Assembly. And yet, what's been happening in Northern Ireland recently is, I would suppose, two things. First is that there is a self-ordained restraint on the actions of Northern Ireland government that they call the parity principle, that they do not think the benefits should be better or worse than they are in the UK, so they match them very closely. But the second thing about what happens in Northern Ireland is that when they wanted to part from that, they didn't like the suggestions that were made for assessments or the, cha or the changes that were being proposed for PIP. And as a result, the Treasury fined the Northern Ireland Assembly on a monthly basis for all the money that they were not saving by doing this. Now, in fact, the subsequent evidence we've got on PIP met, met my own prejudices. I looked at the PIP rules and I couldn't see how it was going to save any money at all. And I couldn't see how it was going to save any money because the big costs of DLA were the extensions given to older people to carry on claiming after the upper age limit and the increasing numbers of people with psychiatric problems who were getting DLA. All of that was there and they were adding in far more liberal rules relating to people with fluctuating conditions. So the effect is the PIP, if anything, is costing more than DLA did. 
But Northern Ireland was being fined for not doing it. And that, I'm afraid, says something about the powers of devolved governments. Two more problems at the bottom. One I've borrowed a name for is the zero-sum game. That is simply that if you've got a fixed budget and you want to make somebody better off, you can't do it without making someone somewhere else worse off. The only way to make things better is to spend more. And all the indications are on the finance are that there's going to be less to spend. The other thing is a problem which I call the laid table. And that is the idea that you can't change benefits from the way that they are. There's a very strong, obviously, people, look, people are on very low incomes. They're desperate for the money. They've all got really strong cases as to why they should get it. But the effect of that can be that everything freezes. And time and again, what we've seen, we saw it with the bedroom tax, um, I've heard it recently about tax credits, people saying, let's spend money to keep benefits the, the, the way that they were two years ago. Now, oddly, that can also work against claimants because, of course, not all the movements are down. The movements are up as well. And if you freeze things, it becomes extremely difficult to carry out any sort of reform. So, what's happening with the Scottish Social Security Bill? The bill is out. It is up for consultation, and they are looking for comments by the 23rd of August. So please bear in mind as you go through what it is that is there. The first thing that they're consulting about is a series of principles. I put here principles from a Welfare Reform Committee report. The Welfare Reform Committee in the Scottish Parliament has now been replaced by the Social Security Committee, but it's basically the same committee. And you can see that they wanted things to have dignity, respect, to be person-centred, which I've already raised questions about, passported, common sense, human rights, simple, not punitive, accessible and such like. Well, a number of these have found their way into the legislation, and the legislation starts off with a series of statements of principle. First of all, that social security is an investment in the Scottish people. Second, that it's a matter of human rights. Third, that it must be done with the dignity of people. Fourth, that the Scottish ministers have a role in ensuring the situation of individuals receiving social security. Fifth is really two principles rolled into one, that it should be evidence-based and that it should be designed with the people. Then there should be continuous improvement and lastly, efficiency and value for money. Uh, I have particular doubts about the last of those. Efficiency technically means that you reduce the unit cost and the way that private firms get to be efficient when public sector is not efficient is typically by what's called adverse selection, getting rid of the difficult, the awkward, and the hard to manage. That's the way to be, to be efficient. I would much rather that they were cost effective, which is trying to reach their aims without wasting money, but that's not the same thing. The concern on the principles, it's difficult to think what the principles will need. All right, you put them into law. The only time I think when it becomes clear that it's got a legal principle is when they're breached. So I don't think it's going to be easy at all to say when, what a dignified treatment is, but I think it's much easier to say what an undignified treatment looks like. So it's possible that there'll be scope for some sorts of legal challenge with that. It also, I think, runs slightly short of some of the other issues we've got here about data sharing, about being responsive, about being coherent. Rather difficult when what you're really doing is inheriting a number of very complex, very difficult benefits. The details of the bill. Well, first of all, the areas covered over here. The bill is a holding bill. It doesn't tell us what the benefits will be. We've already had some announcement about the benefits, and we know that it's different from the terms of the bill. Disability assistance will be something like PIP, something like attendance allowance, something like DLA, though we don't quite yet know what. Personally, I would rather like to see a return to mobility allowance, which I think could be done within these powers. And the reason I'd like to see it is that at the moment, people haven't a clue what on earth DLA and PIP are about or for. And it's not just a matter of explanation, it just doesn't relate to their circumstances. 
Whereas if you actually say this bit's for care and this bit's for mobility, that could make more sense. At the moment, the take up of the mobility component is actually rather poor. Carers' assistance, we've had the announcement that there will be a carer's allowance supplement coming in in 2018, one of the earliest things to be done. And that will be six monthly payments topping up the DWP benefit. Funeral expenses, I've already said what the problem is. I would actually quite like to see that coming out of Social Security altogether because I can't see any way of doing it and checking people's income and getting it to work out. The sort of thing the government could do instead is to provide free burials and cremation. I know that some people may be worried that you think that this gives people an incentive to die. Uh, I don't share that particular concern. Something Scotland has in abundance is land, and it could allocate land for funerals if it so wished, saving people anything from about um, five hundred pounds in some local authorities up to about two and a half thousand to three thousand in others. Yeah, oh yes, there's, there's a, uh, a CA, uh, Citizens Advice Scotland have been producing reports about the costs and the differential cost of funerals in different places. Um, all right, there's, there's, a, there's a limit to what, to what you can do, but I think, yes, things might be done differently. But anyway, the funeral assistance scheme will be off the ground in, if that's the right expression, in 2019. Cold spell heating assistance uh, is the cold weather payment, and that's temperature based and it's done retroactively when there's been a particular cold snap. Winter heating assistance causes people such confusion and the government keep, keeps talking about this, saying well, we can give people some fuel. Winter heating assistance, winter fuel payment, is much easier to understand when you realise that it's not paid for winter and it's not about fuel. Uh, the, the qualifying date for winter fuel payment is actually, I think, 30th of September? Sorry? November, December. No, no, September. Uh, <laughs> not when you get the benefit, but when you, the qualifying date at which you qualify for, for receiving the money. What it specifically said in the legislation is that winter fuel payment was intended to be a help with budgeting. And a help with budgeting is about something quite different. That's one of the reasons, incidentally, why it has to be paid to um, people in Spain. Because it's not about winter and it's not about your heating. The, but having said that, we'll, I don't quite yet know how that will work out. Employment injury assistance. Well, at the moment, that is a straight inheritance of the industrial injury scheme, less a number of the prescribed industrial diseases, which for reasons I cannot begin to imagine, were not was still reserved in the Scotland Act. And I have no idea why pneumoconiosis, for example, is, has to be kept by the UK government rather than being passed through. Don't get that one. Short-term assistance we already have in the Scottish Welfare Fund. Top-up benefits. This is where you are going to add money to DWP benefits. I was sceptical about that because the model that's used in housing benefit works because housing benefit is so much decentralised. But what they've done with carers', carers allowance is instead to go for a six month supplement with the main question marks being how they're going to identify um, which, who is in Scotland. These are all, as I said, holding provisions. Very little by way of detail in them. And the reason is given in the quotation at the bottom in the explanatory memorandum, which says, putting the detailed rules is a deliberate choice and is key to the Scottish Government's approach to making the legislation accessible. So the way to make legislation accessible is just to have general principles in the law and then to do the rest by secondary regulation, which, yes, I don't quite get it either. There are some important things, though, I think, in the new Act. One is that it's going to be handled centrally to a Scottish Social Security Agency. I don't know much more about where or who the Scottish Social Security Agency will be. I have heard it said that it will be in two locations in Scotland. And that's about as much as I know at the moment. Claims. There is a, a large presumption that benefits will be claimed 
That doesn't have to be true. There are lots of areas where you could do this by referral. You could do it on the basis of evidence. Um, for example, when a baby is born, you don't need to require somebody to make a claim in order to get help. And that will cover... And at first I thought that they were precluding that from the Act, but I've had a correspondence with a parliamentary draftsman on that, who says, no, no, they'll be able to do that within the regulations. Decision-making. At the moment... Sum up soon. Right, OK, yes. Deci I'm going to I'm gonna have to speed up. Uh, Decision-making. Mandatory reconsideration was introduced a very short time ago. They are keeping a reconsideration system rather than allowing people to go directly to appeal. That, I think, is a, you know, basically a two-stage two process. I'm not sure why. Appeals, good thing, appeals to the first tier tribunal will be possible for all Scottish benefits. And then over payments, they are keeping the rule which was first introduced with tax credit and is now in universal credit and other benefits, that people who are overpaid benefit can be required to pay it regardless of whether they knew about it, could have known about it, got it as a result of efficient, official error, didn't understand why the payment was in, or all those. All of those will be ignored. You have to repay. And there's going to be a further criminal offence of failure to notify of something that you ought to have known that you ought to have notified. And that will be criminal, additionally to having to repay all the benefit. Um, now... What else could we do? That's my last slide, and it's going to take the ages. So, we could do an awful lot more than what I've just sketched out. We could change aspects of administration, deal with complaints by responding to people's complaints rather than requiring an appeal at all. Fast track re judicial review. Scotland is already in control of its own courts. But it's really, really difficult to get judicial review of administrative action. Outreach, making sure that the agency goes out to people to get them the benefits, rather than making it their responsibility to come to the agency. Changing procedures, short-term employment courses I've already mentioned. Revive linking rules. Linking rules are where people are claiming repeatedly, and you link the things together in order to simplify it and say, that's all right, you signed off three days ago, come back on. Changing unfair rules. The Scotland Act went out of its way to say that Scotland would have no power in relation to sanctions. But it also said that's unless in exceptional circumstances. There's a big, big literature, a long experience of what exceptional means in social security and exceptional doesn't mean what the DWP obviously now think it means. I think there's a big scope for actually overturning sanctions on the basis that they are a breach of the centuries-old principle in British law that's called natural justice, the right to hear the other side. In America, you don't get a sanction until you've had a hearing. That's not universally true, but it's true in, in certain states anyway. That's the sort of thing which I think we could actually build in. And I think there's a very good argument made by Michael Adler previously to say that actually the practice of sanctions is illegal in British law. We'd have the power to shorten the wait for universal credit. And in some cases, we could do it differently, offering services, restore housing subsidies, rather than paying housing benefit. Social inclusion services, I've mentioned things about, for example, like the courses that are done in France under the name of social inclusion, where you actually learn positive skills. There are, way, there are way, other ways of doing things. More specifically, disability benefits. We could reintroduce some of the older benefits. If Scotland is responsible for severe disabled allowance, we could have a severe disabled allowance again. You have the power, you have the power. We could reform compensation laws. I'm not sure why we're having industrial injury only transferred, but we could combine that with lots of other things in the courts, as they've done in New Zealand, where there's no fault liability for disability. We could revise different age barriers. One of the greatest anomalies in disability benefits is 
that the age at which you become disabled critically affects which benefits you're entitled to. That's the age at which you become disabled, not the age you are at the point of claiming. It's, it's really quite ridiculous. We could go for more automatic entitlement. We can change assessment procedures, at least for PIP, and possibly for more, where we can nod people through where the condition is obvious, some things can be decided by a receptionist, where we can give, define certain qualifying conditions, a medical certification would be enough, where we take the evidence from people who know, because they're in contact, medical reports, and then we come to individual assessment, which doesn't have to be done with the sort of scheme we've got now. The testing of that scheme done in the 1980s basically said it's only the first three disabilities that make a difference, and everything after that is further unnecessary detail. We do not need to ask disabled people routinely whether they can go to the toilet. It's irrelevant for the vast majority of people. And it's only a small number of people where it's a complex assessment where you actually want to go into more detail. And we could introduce new benefits if we wish to do so because we've got the power to create new benefits. I've suggested there a blind person's allowance. AAH is a French initial, allocation aux adultes handicapés, which is for being severely disabled. We could do that if we wished. So there are lots and lots of other things we could do. Now, apologies for running over. Let's try and get this to the question, what can you do? Well, there is a consultation in progress. The committees will be making their decisions over this summer, there is a deadline from the Social Security Committee for submissions of evidence to the Social Security Committee for the 23rd of August, which is a Wednesday. And clearly, there is a will on many sides of the Scottish Parliament to try to refine this, to try to get it right. I think that there is a problem, or well, a whole set of problems, which I shall cover in the rules of the game, to say it is not that easy, but I hope that that at least will get people started. And the obvious question for you as a group is, what do you want to do and what do you want to change?